Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, and I'm the guy that wrote Task Manager back in 1995. Today, we're going to continue with the second in our installment of Windows Source Code Review by looking at the actual original source to the Windows XP Task Manager. So the part of Task Manager that we're going to look at today is the Applications tab, better known internally as the Task Page. This is where top-level windows are shown. And so, if we go in and we say Run Notepad, we'll see it appears as a task. If we run Calc, it's another task, and we can run Write. So now we've got three tasks. We're going to go through the code today. We're going to see how it enumerates Windows stations, desktops, windows, and manages all of this complexity behind the scenes. It's all in straight C++. I hope you enjoy it. If you haven't already seen the first installment, I encourage you to start there, but whatever works for you. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel either way and turn on all notifications for the channel so that you don't miss them in order as they come out, because they will make more sense in order. Are you subscribed yet? Today, we're going to look at the task page. This is the page that represents every running top level window in your system. So if you start calc and notepad and write, you'll have three tasks running. You might have more than that in processes over on the details process page, but these are the top level windows and the ones that you generally manage the most. So that's why there's a task page. And by the way, there is a little breadcrumb up in the corner here. So you can see that we're inside of task page.cpp and we're currently looking at task page proc. So if you get lost as I jump around and you want to see where we're at, that will kind of give you a help. The code to the task page is located somewhat predictably in task page.cpp. I like to keep things straightforward. And we're going to take a look at the winproc, which is actually down near the bottom of the file first, but it's the one that does the bulk of the structure and work for the task page. So we're going to start there. Here we see task page proc. That is the name of the window procedure for the task page. And of course, it receives a handle to its own window, a message indicating what message is being sent to the window, a wpram, which used to be a word, but is now a wpram32, and an lpram, which is similarly also lpram32 now. Now in Win32, there's no linkage between your C++ object and a window. If you want to write a class that encapsulates a window like the task page does, then it's up to you to maintain that association that this is my class object and this is my window handle. What we do is we store user data on the window handle that includes our pointer to our task page object. So anytime we need a pointer to the task page, we can get it from the window handle by looking up the name value pair for GWLP user data. So the first thing this code does is call check parent deferrals on the message. And what this function will do is to check whether this is a message best handled by the parent window and not by the task page itself. Let's have a look at that. So the messages that it has to pass up to the parent to let it manage are generally all the mouse buttons. Everything else is just handled directly by the page itself, but mouse movement is tracked by the parent page. And it dialog is sent when your dialog is being created. And in this case, we're going to store our object pointer on the user data name value pair. Now by convention, and there's nothing to enforce this, the lparam is passed as a pointer to the object for the task page. So the first thing it does is squirrel that away as the user data on the window handle, and there we'll have it as mentioned earlier, whenever we need it. There's a small image list that contains images that might need to be used by the list view itself, and those are in this task uh, image list here that is set here. One style point was that I wanted the selection to be persistent even when you weren't actually activated. One theme you'll notice running consistent throughout Task Manager is that I wanted everything to work pretty much equally well with just the keyboard and not the mouse because I figured power users would just bring it up and then use the keyboard to move around. So one of the things that I did was to ensure that the selection is preserved when you tab away from the list view. And that's done with LVS show cell always by turning it on in the extended style, oh pardon me, in just the style of the list view itself. Apparently there's a system policy you can turn on to turn off the run dialog and that is enforced here. It just grays it out if it's not possible. I suppose you could write your own program to enable that menu and that would probably work around it, but I don't encourage that. Next, we're going to subclass the list view so we can modify its behavior. Let's see what kind of madness we cook up in that one. Okay, it's going to set the window long pointer for the wind proc, which is it's going to set the wind proc for this window to be our list view wind proc function. Let's take a look at what it handles special. So if you change the system color, you want Task Manager painting to reflect that immediately. And so this immediately, as soon as a system color change comes through, goes and recreates the brushes it needs to do its painting. To reduce the amount of flicker seen, I uh, make a change where I only erase the area of the list view which is not held by items. So since I know I'm going to paint the items anyway, why erase them first? We'll go back to subclass list view. And from there, we'll go back to the wind proc for the task page, which is where we were. And we were looking at init dialog. 
That is the end of init dialog. We saw these shenanigans on the main page where we go in and we intercept left mouse button down and my left mouse button up and we check to see if it's in the client area and if it's in the client area and we're in the widget mode that has no borders, then we allow you to drag the window by grabbing the client area. And so we lie and say you've actually grabbed the caption area when you click on the client area. If a command message comes through, it's handled right here. These will be things like menu items. Let's have a look. So task page handle WM command has a switch that looks at which menu item is being sent. If it's find process, then it's going to get a list of all the HWINs that are currently selected in the list view. And we'll see how it gets this later, but for now, instead of just getting a list of list view items, it's coming back with a list of window handles that are represented by the tasks that you've selected in the list view. Now, rather than having the task page and the process page share some interface directly in between them, and they just use a window message to do things like when the task page wants to go to details for a task. So if you do that, it just sends a message to the process page that says, hey, go find this window and look up what process it is, or maybe it passes, actually it passes it by process ID. So it says, go find this process ID and select it in your list view, please. That way there are no friend functions or any nonsense like that. So in this case, when it gets a switch from large to small icons or details or whatever other mode, it sends that up to the parent because the parent actually has a menu that handles it. And if it needs to call the task page to make that switch, it will do so. This is the case of either selecting the menu item that says switch to task or by clicking the switch to button or probably by double clicking the item in the task list. First thing it does then is to get a list of all the currently selected HWINs. What's it do if you switch to more than one window at a time? Let's find out. So the last active here is the last top level pop-up window that the application that you're concerned with has actually activated and brought up to the top. That's likely the window we want to activate, so that's the one we're going to check. First, we make sure it's a valid window handle, and if it isn't, because maybe it's gone away in the couple of microseconds since you last did an enumeration, it'll just beep and return without crashing. If the window in question is disabled, it can't do the switch. So again, it will message beep. In the cases where everything else has gone fine so far, it calls switch to this window to activate that window, and then it calls show window minimize on the task manager if you've got minimize on use turned on as an option. So that way, if you've got task manager up and you switch to another window with that option turned on, task manager will automatically minimize itself at that point. The next two commands we worry about are tiling horizontally. I don't think this is still in Windows Task Manager today, but back in the XP days when everything was still based on tiling or cascading windows, I allowed you to pick an arbitrary selection of windows within the Task Manager and tile just those. So whereas if you went to Windows, I guess that was probably a Win 3.1 thing, I don't think there was a Win 95 exposed version of it, you could say tile windows or cascade windows, but it would do them all. And so this way it allowed you to pick just the windows you were working on, so you could pick four windows and say tile those and it would do that properly for you. One thing I'm a little confused by is the fact that there's a command here for tile horizontally and there's a tile horizontal control, but there's no tile vertical control. Was there only a button for tile horizontally perhaps? But again, it's basically orthogonal. It's gonna make sure the windows are not minimized first. Let's check that out. It goes through all the windows and if the window is currently minimized down to the tray before you say activate it, it's going to switch that window out of being minimized and back up into a regular window. Cascade is the same as tile, but instead of calling tile, it's going to call cascade on the window handles. One thing I should clarify with this get hwins function is you tell it whether or not you want only the selected items. And if you say just the selected items, it will return you the window handles of the tasks that you have selected in the task list. If you don't say selected only, it will give you all the windows. So in this case, when none are selected, it means tile or whatever, every window. Here you can see show window async, which is a good idea because let's say task manager has to minimize eight windows and they're all like Photoshop's or something heavyweight. Well, they're all probably gonna page or do something when they're minimized because they get woken up even by the process of minimizing them. And so it will churn for a while in some cases. You don't want task manager hung or you don't want them all to go serially one after the other. You want them all to go down at once. And so this does an async call and it activates or minimizes every window in that list. Bring to front is very much like the code we saw for switch to, except it does not actually switch to. It does surface the windows, but it doesn't then switch context and then minimize task manager. Now, if you've noticed that the end task option on the task page is kind of weak sauce, that's because it's calling the end task, which is far more polite than end process. End task will send a close message and eventually report your window is hung and perhaps ask if you want to end now, you'll get that workflow, but it's not going to just kill the process, which is something you can do in the details page. So if you need to do that, you do the go to process by selecting the one process you want, go to details and then kill the process if you really want to be hardcore. 
So now that we've handled WM command windows, we've got to take a look at notification messages. Those are messages that come through from things like the list view itself saying something has happened in the list view that you need to know about, so I'm going to notify you. And there's a special function, handle task page notify, that handles these by itself. So if you double click an item, it's going to have the same effect as switch to, and that's how that's handled here. So when it gets a double click, it simulates it by sending a W command for the switch to command. One thing to keep in mind is that the task manager display is pretty dynamic, so it refreshes probably at least once a second or more often, depending on how you've got it set. And of course, things can change from second to second. Processes can come and go. So if you've selected four processes and then one of them goes away, this code has to account for that by looking for the item change notification and seeing if the number of selected items is any different than it was a moment ago. And if it is, then it knows something has changed and it has to update its UI state, so it will call the update UI state. Let's look at update UI state. This is a pattern that I used a lot in my code. I don't know that I ever saw anybody else. Maybe it's really common, but what I do is I let my app run and then before I refresh and render it, I go through and I update the state of everything based on what's selected or what controls are activated and so on in the UI. So rather than having say a radio button change the visibility of something else, I will just go through and in one pass, check each radio button and what they're responsible for and do the entire UI layout in one pass. Now, some of the commands and menu items that you can send don't make sense when you have no items selected. So let's see. End task, can't do that on no tasks. Switch to, can't switch to no tasks. So when you have no items selected, it's gonna go through and it's gonna disable the end task and the switch to options. I might have checked the this pointer rather than the I current page because it seems a little fragile to have indexed pages and then rely on what their numbers are. In this case, it's checking to see if this current page is zero, which probably means to the code that the task page is visible. And if it is, it goes through and it updates its UI. And if it's not, it's not visible, so it doesn't have to. But comparing current page to zero is a little sketchy. I'm not sure I'd do it that way today. All right, we're back inside of LVM item changed. The next one we care about is column click. That's when the user clicks the header control at the top of a column. If it wasn't already selected, we make that column the new sort column, and then we sort everything by that column. If you're clicking on a column that's already the selected sort column, it just inverts it at that point. So it sorts bottom to top instead of top to bottom. So here you can see if the column ID that we're now we're going to sort by is the column we've just clicked on, then we reverse the sort direction by multiplying it by negative one. Otherwise, we make it the new sort column and we set the default direction to be negative one, which is ascending. We then call resort task array because you may have changed the sort order and now we need to update it. Resort task array creates a new pointer array, which is predictably an array of pointers. We'll look at that a little bit later. I don't want to get too far out of field here. So this function is going to create a brand new pointer array, and then it's going to walk the items that are selected in the list view, and it's going to insert their objects into the task array. It's going to do insert into sorted array so that the entire list stays sorted at all times. Insert into sorted array. We can only assume it's a beautiful binary search. Oh, but it's not because 28 years ago, I left a comment saying, we should probably use a binary insert here, not linear. Didn't really matter when you had like 10 tasks running, but if you had a thousand tasks running, it could get rather exponentially expensive. So I assume this code is not still in the task manager and has been updated long ago. But if you took the uh, NT4 task manager and ran it with thousands of processes, it might get a little janky. So what it's going to do, it's going to walk the task list and then work until it finds one that is less than, which means it compares favorably and it's going to insert there. Otherwise it will insert at the end and then return. Back in resort task array, we can see that once it's done and it has inserted all the items into the array in sorted fashion, it then makes that the new array here by deleting the old array and setting the array to point to the new one. It then returns. Timer event. Why would it call timer event after column click? Well, I got a feeling that's to force a refresh. Let's go see what it does. A task page, now remember, any page can receive a timer event that basically says it's time to go do your stuff and update now. The parent page doesn't know what the child pages do, just that they need to be updated periodically. We'll come back to timer event in more detail shortly, but again, it's a little complicated for now to get off into it. So we're just gonna continue here with the other notification messages for the task page. LVN get disp info is sent to you as the programmer when the list view needs to draw something like a line of text or an icon or whatever you have in a list view cell. So this is filling in the text that needs to be supplied in order to render a cell within the list view. The next message we want to look at is the context menu message. When that comes through, we've got to figure out what context you're clicking on, what tasks are selected, what verbs are available, how to build a menu, and so on. 
So let's handle the task list context menu. So the first thing it does is get the array of selected tasks in the task list. And if it gets that, it comes through. And here is another case where I've taken pains to make sure it works really well without a mouse. If you've ever pressed Shift F10 to bring up the context menu and had the menu appear somewhere nonsensical, like wherever the mouse is off screen perhaps, or up in another corner, or maybe the menu comes up in the top left of the screen, that's because they're assuming that you've invoked the menu with a mouse. But when the L param and the W param contain FF, FF in their low words, that means that you've got negative one, negative one, and you have no mouse coordinates. So in that case, we go and we get the first selected item, get its item rectangle, map those window points into uh, client space, and then return that. That way, the menu comes up right over the item when you press Shift F10 instead of where the mouse is or someplace useless. Now that we know where our menu will appear, we load the pop-up menu out of the resources. That'll contain all the text that's localized into the current languages. And if we successfully loaded the menu, we're gonna set the default menu item to be switched to. That way, if the menu is just dismissed with enter or with space or whatever the default is for menus, which I don't recall at this very second, your default action will be switched to. Like before, we have to do some preparation depending on how many items you have selected. So if you haven't selected at least two items, cascade, tile, and so on don't really make sense, so those are disabled. Bring to front is enabled only when you have exactly one item selected. Before we track the menu, I do a pause here. And the reason I do that is because I found that otherwise, if you started to do a track pop-up menu and then you let the task manager refresh in the background, now your selection's jumping around underneath your menu. So I pause it when the menu comes up and we clear it, the pause, when the menu goes away. And we can see that just up here. When we go back, menu select, when you've selected an item, which can be, of course, negative one, meaning you didn't select any item, we unpause. The next message of interest is WM size, which indicates that it's our time now to go through and size all of the child controls that are within the task page. So let's go to size task page. Gets the client rectangle, and it does a begin to for window pause, meaning it's going to do a whole batch of window sizing and moving all at once. And we're going to build up a list internally and then let it run through them and do them all at once. It's not, as I said last time, it's not really atomic, but it'll, it prevents you from getting the situation where you do one window and the next window and then the next window and the next window, and they're all painting and animating and causing flicker. The way the sizing code here works is that it anchors everything off of a master control, which is the run button, which is, I believe, in the bottom right. As you size the window pane around, you'll see that the control in the bottom right moves and then that control is used to anchor everything else. So the first thing it does is to calculate a delta X and a delta Y that represent how far the run button has moved in whatever direction. So let's look at sizing the list box. It goes and gets the window handle for the list box. It gets the client rectangle for the list box and then maps those coordinates into window space for the desktop as opposed to for within my window. We then figure out how big the list box X and Y should be, and then we size it accordingly without moving it, changing it Z order, or activating it, because all we're ever going to do, because it's always anchored up at the top left, is change its size. This makes that more efficient. To give you the most usable space, it looks like it backs off the width of the status column, which is on the right-hand side of the task page, and then gives you a column which is everything but the status column. So it makes use of whatever desktop space you do have within Task Manager to make the default zero column the biggest one by default. So it expands or shrinks depending on the amount of space available to it. Now we have an array of task controls. Let's go take a look at that. Just three, switch to, end task, and run. Those are the buttons. And each of those will be moved and modified by the DX value that we calculated earlier. So as the run button moves, the other buttons will chase it and follow it equally. And at the very end, we call end for window pause, which then goes through and does them all at once. Back in our task proc page, we'll take a look at on settings change. This is whenever anything interesting changes about the system, like colors or settings or schemes or anything else like that. You're going to see it's going to go through. It's going to remove the image lists and rebuild them. It's going to load the default icons again and then force a refresh. If it receives a system color change, it's going to pass that on to the task list as well so that it knows to change its color as needed. So this is a case of message forwarding off to a child window. One of the more complicated things that the task page has to do is to manage columns of the list view. Let's see how it adds columns to the list view when the list view is created now. That's what the setup columns function is going to do. It's going to get the window handle to the list task list itself. It's going to delete all items that are currently in the task list. It's going to delete all columns that are currently in the task list. 
And it's going to go through and add all the new columns in the current order in the active task or column array. And that is a list of column identifiers that tell me the things I need to know, like how that column is formatted and so on. So if we go look at the task column defaults, which is an array of column descriptors that you get out of the box before you've changed anything, we can see there's a format specifier saying the text should be aligned left in each of these columns and then a default width and just a comment with what uh, column that applies to. We then insert the column, continue our loop and proceed on. Now you might remember when we looked at the C page class that one of the things that a C page has to do is to be able to initialize itself. And this is the initialize function that implements that for the C task page. This is the point at which it's going to create its actual dialog window, which will be the window that holds the task control contents. We give it our module instance, the ID of the task page resource that defines what the actual dialog looks like and where the controls are laid out on it. The main window, the page proc for the win proc that we'll be running messages through for this particular window. And so if we successfully created the task page, then we will go set up the columns. I believe we've already looked at that. Once everything is set up, we're gonna force feed it a single timer event. This is where it's going to go through and do its enumeration of all the windows and desktops and window stations. We'll see that in just a moment. And if anything failed during creation, we tear the rest of it back down here at the end. Let's take a look at timer event and see what it does on every update pass. So timer event is the function call that will be called on a page object when it's its turn to refresh and re-enumerate everything. So the task page, for example, will enumerate all running tasks on the system. The process page will enumerate all running processes on the system and so on. Each has its own job and each does its job when timer event is called on its page object. As we can see in the case of the task list, it has to go through and enumerate tasks across the entire system because you could be administrator and have access to kill any task or you could have multiple logons with your own particular user ID and have access to them that way. Whatever the case, you wanna make sure that you're not skipping any just because they're on a different window station or desktop. But what's a window station? Well, in Windows, a window station is your display, monitor, and keyboard, or at least that's the easiest way to keep it in your head, I think. The desktop, you can have multiple of. You can have multiple desktops on a particular window station, and you can cycle through them with various hotkeys and third-party utilities. There's not a lot of desktop support built into Windows itself, but I don't mean having two monitors. It's basically like having one desktop behind another, and you can surface the topmost. It's a complication you don't see a lot in Windows, kind of like window stations. But if you're going to enumerate all tasks, you have to start by enumerating all window stations, and then on each window station, enumerate all desktops, and on every desktop, enumerate every window. So it's a three-layer deep enumeration, and that's what we're going to perform here. It's the only way to authentically and completely enumerate all windows in the system. So we're going to start off by calling do enum window stations. Let's go check that out. We give it our new window stations function that's going to be called back every time there is a new window station to be identified. The first thing we're going to do is create a new thread on which to call the function that's been passed in by the caller. We're not going to do it on the main thread, and it's not because we want to be parallel or efficient or fancy. The reason is because our thread already owns windows which belong to a desktop which belongs to a window station. So you can see here we've got the enumeration function, the enum windows proc that we're going to see in a second. Then we've got the lpram which is passed in as context to it. We've got two events, a child and a parent event, and that will be used to manage when the child process is fully complete. We create the thread and it will start executing at our thread callback function that we previously specified. Once we've created the thread, we signal the child event to tell that thread to start doing its work, and then we wait for the parent event, which will signal back to us when it has done its work. That way we know the start and stop of the enumeration and the thread's lifespan can mirror that. Each time a window station is found, it will call our enum window stations function. Let's see that. Now the primary reason that we have to do this on a background thread is because we're going to call open window station and we can't do that from a thread that's already on another window station. So we have to create a blank thread that's never been on a window station, windows or a desktop, and then we'll pass it around and let it do the enumeration work. So we're going to save our current window station, set our process window station to be the new window station that was just discovered, allocate a string to hold the name of the window station, and then on this window station we're going to call enum desktops with a new callback. So for every window station that's found in the system, our callback will be called, and that callback will in turn then call enumerate desktops on that window station. And it will call the enum desktops function. It looks very much like the enum window stations function because it's basically following the same process. But in this case, it's going to open the desktop, save away its current desktop, jump onto that desktop with the thread, get all the information it needs, and then enumerate all the windows that are on this desktop that are in this window station. And that will in turn call the enum windows proc func. 
So this function will be called once for every window in the system, for every window station, for every desktop, and then ultimately for every window. And it will all come through this function. And the first thing we're going to do is see if this window has an owner or if it's not visible. And in that case, we don't care about it. If it's an own window, it's not a top level parent window. And if it's invisible, it's not going to show up in the task list. Next, we get the title of the window, and I'm not entirely sure what internal get window text does. I think it bypasses sending a WM get text to the window to get its title, um, but it's a long time ago, and I don't actually remember. But I'm pretty sure it's the, the net is that it won't hang talking to the window when you're trying to get its title. If it's an empty string, there's really not much point in even showing it in the task list, so we don't. And here's an interesting comparison, a hard-coded comparison to program manager in English, which I'm guessing is the title name for all program managers, at least in English. Now, maybe if you're localizing the entire system, this string in turn also gets localized and then it matches the name of the program manager window. I hope that's how it works. We then run through our existing list of tasks and find out if this is the one we just found. If it's already in our list, we'll just set the data on it, which stores away the title, the window station desktop, how many times we've seen it, how many passes we've observed this window being present and so on. Now, if we did not find it in the current list of tasks, it must be a new one, so we'll wind up adding it to the end. We'll call set data again to set all the specifics on the task. And because in the list view, we're going to show you the application's icon, which I will get from the application, we have to have an image list for the list view to be able to work with. So we've created an image list in the background, actually two, a large image list and a small image list, because often apps have icons optimized for 16 by 16 or larger. There's some magic here in that if we can't get one of the icon sizes, we convert the other icon size down or up as needed to replace the missing icon. And that way, even if your app only has a small or only has a large, we'll make it work. And at the very end, because this is a new task, we add it to the array of tasks. And what, you might wonder, is in the array of tasks? Is it just Windows? Well, no. It's a task object defined by Task Manager to keep track of top-level tasks. And it contains things like the HWIND, the window title, the window station, the desktop, whether it's hung, how many times we've seen this window in previous enumerations, what its small icon is, and what its large icon is. These are the possible columns that you can have on the task page, and each one gets a bit. That bit is then unioned with a D word. What's the point? Well, I can set individual bits. So let's say just the status column changes. So I'll go and set MF dirty call status to one. And that will go in through and set just the third bit. The way unions work in C, these share the same memory. So the D word is the same as these five bits. And of course, at that point, 27 will be unused, but the third bit will represent F dirty column status. So if I set F dirty column status to be one, it will just set the third bit. Why would I do all this work? Well, then I can just at the end check MF dirty. If I need to know which column specifically to optimize painting, I can look and see which bit is set. But as long as I know that MF dirty is non-zero, then I know one of its column bits has been set and this row will need some attention. That's the purpose of this one. Set data is the function that takes the information like the window station, desktop, and window handle, title, so on, and then stores it in the task list object. We can take a quick look at that, but I got a feeling it's gonna be pretty straightforward. Uh, it's not, <laughs> sorry. What did I forget? Why is this so hard? Well, it has to allocate some memory for the window station name and the desktop name, and the title. And this is one of the places the task manager itself is at a bit of risk. So it calls send message timeout because what it's actually doing is saying, Go to this window that's running, could be calc, could be some other process, could be anything, but we're gonna pull its icons. So we're gonna send it a message saying, hey, can I have your small icon? And hey, can I have your large icon? And if that app just says, and hangs, then we're going to be hung ourselves. So we use send message timeout with a 100 millisecond timeout, which means we're giving the app 100 milliseconds to give us an icon back. And if it doesn't come back in time, you don't get an icon on the task list until next time we enumerate. And so that is the task list page. It's not a terribly exciting page and the code doesn't do an incredible amount, but some of these concepts like the dirty bits and so on will be used again in a much more complicated version of a page, the process page. The process page is the one you really wanna see. It's got all the deep down dirty information from the kernel about the processes and how to enumerate CPU times and all that. Learning how the task page works is kind of like training wheels for the process page, which is much more complicated, but uses many of these same concepts, such as the dirty bits for column tracking and so on. So when we get to the process page, you'll be well prepared because you've already seen a somewhat simpler implementation for the task page. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and that you've got notifications turned on so that you get these episodes in order as they come out. They'll make a lot more sense. 
If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum, however you define that. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known way back then. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. Please leave a like on the video if you did enjoy it. And in the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.